So it's quite a pleasure to be here. Um, I was happy to accept the invitation. I've been thinking about housing in one way or the other for my entire um, academic career, and it is really quite lovely to see all of you here to think about uh, homelessness and housing. So welcome and thank you. Um, so today my, my job is to think about um, housing stability and implications for well-being and think about the U.S. research base, and then I will rely on my colleagues to help fit that in with uh, your national context. So the first thing I thought I would do is talk about why I think about homelessness. I think it's really important um, to be implicit about your, to be explicit about your implicit assumptions about why you think about what you think about. So I'm going to tell you my approach to thinking about homelessness. I don't only think about homelessness because I think about housing as existing on a continuum from stably, consistently housed over time to homelessness. And there are many different states in between that. So homelessness is one outcome that I think about because it's part of this continuum. Um, so I want to make that explicit, why I think about what I do. And also, in terms of the definitions of homelessness, they vary across country. I consume research by your wonderful scholars here. And the one thing that is consistent across country is that every country's approach to thinking about homelessness takes as its uh, important thing stable, consistent housing, right? So when we look at the research, sometimes it'll be a very strict definition of homelessness, sleeping unsheltered, right? And sometimes a broader definition, but they all share one thing, stable, consistent housing. Now, the other thing that is really important for me thinking about homelessness is that you can't think about homelessness only that an individual or family is homeless without thinking about housing markets, right? So I wanna make that very explicit. Housing in the US is largely provided in the private market, okay, that's the context, okay? And so what that means is that individuals and families meet a housing market with their given set of conditions, right? They meet a housing market with whatever their earnings or income are, okay? Housing markets are segmented. We're not all in the same housing market. We're in the housing market that we can afford, right? So you meet that particular housing market. So when you think about families or individuals, you have to think about their given conditions meeting a certain segment of the housing market. The other thing to know in the U.S. for sure is that the housing options, I mean the kind of stock and the services available, the actors and the markets vary geographically substantially and sometimes within small geographic units like within a city, right? So there's a lot of variation. Now, I think about housing and talk about it that way and I think that homelessness is a subset of this larger question because we all care about where we live and with whom we live and what the conditions of that housing are. Everybody got up this morning somewhere and it was deeply meaningful to you. So we all intuitively have that thought. Now the research base around that intuition is a little bit more tricky, but let's take it as a basic fact that our intuition is that housing matters. The naughty details of what research can tell us is what we're gonna walk through a little bit today. Okay? The reason why we care about housing is because it's not just a roof over your head, it is shelter. It is a bundle of goods, and in the U.S. context, it delivers a bunch of other things, like the schools that you have access to, the public goods that you have access to, how quickly your trash is picked up, whether or not the police come quickly. It's a bundle of goods. It's not just the roof. Okay. Now, this bundle of goods that we call housing is needed to actualize all other goals that we know to be deeply important, things like educational outcomes, health, and labor market success. Now, there is a large body of research looking at particular parts of housing, the bundle that is housing, and outcomes for children and family. So I'm talking about across this large body of research, there's convincing evidence okay, that inequalities in access, stability, and affordability of that housing are related to some serious social problems. Right? Poor health and educational outcomes, inadequate medical care, hunger, and homelessness. Now, the second part of what I think about um, over the course of my career is I think about um, economically vulnerable families. Okay, so in the US context, we know that low-income families are markedly more likely than their higher income counterparts to move for reasons that are not a marker of upward mobility. Okay, the US are a mobile people. If you look at national statistics about US moving, um, over the course of a five-year period, U.S. populations move quite a bit, and some of that moving is awesome. You got a better job, you decided to couple up, and you moved into bigger and better housing, right? 
So if you just look at national numbers, you're obscuring variation that really matters. When you break it apart by income, you, know, you can see in the US data that lower income families are more likely to, re, uh, to move for reasons that are not about upward mobility. Okay? They're more likely to, to move because a relationship broke up. Okay? They're more likely to move because their housing costs increased and they weren't affordable. And they're more likely to move because of a job loss. Okay? So that in and of itself is important because it tells you that the moving that we're seeing may be problematic. It's not markers of upward mobility. Okay. Now, what are the implications of this moving for folks lower down on the income distribution in the US? Okay. We know from the research base that multiple annual moves, so we're talking about the rental market here. In the US, it's normative to sign a lease generally annually. So you might think that moving once a year is normative, and maybe it is. But moving multiple times in a year implies a, an instability that is concerning. Okay. And we know that multiple annual moves are associated with poor child outcomes. Okay? The other thing we know in the US is that these moves I'm telling you that are associated with uh, poor health outcomes for children are also underestimated. So any of the published data that you research and you get some kind of coefficient, some number that tells you um, how it's a bad outcome, it's too low because we're under reporting it in our data. So anything that you read in the research base is gonna be an underestimate of the negative consequences of annual, multiple annual moves. Now here's the other thing. Let's think about housing and family life. Family defined very broadly, whatever the um, economic unit is working together, okay? Housing costs in the US constitute the largest proportion of uh, family budgets, okay? Not food, not anything else, it's housing, okay? Now we also know this is particularly the case for low income renters. Now this next point is an important one and an interesting one. There is some evidence, there are several uh, papers that tell us that the regularity of your income, not the total amount, okay, if you hold the total amount that you've received constant, the same, but we, you receive it less regularly, that less regular receipt of income is associated with poor housing outcomes for low-income families. Now here's the intuition here. There's intuition here, okay? Because generally the conversation is about how can we increase income, and I'm not arguing against that, please. What I'm talking about is the stability of income makes a difference. It makes a difference for housing because we generally plan our housing, right? So let's say you're a custodial parent. You're a custodial mom in the US context, okay? And you don't know how much money you're going to be receiving monthly. That income stream is not reliable. You could say to yourself, moving is super stressful, particularly with kids, we have to pack up. So I'm going to get housing that's of poor quality and a lower cost of housing because I know I can maintain it. It's a completely rational decision to make. So this thing about regular income, I think is important to consider and it's not generally considered. And part of the reason is because we don't measure, we measure income annually and that's not the game for folks lower on the income distribution. Looking at someone's annual income is not super useful. Looking at monthly income and even weekly income is where the action is, right? Okay. Now, as I said before, housing and well-being interact at that point where you take your particular family, your particular condition, and then you step into a housing market, okay? You meet that housing market. The personal characteristics of a family or an individual, these characteristics are differentially associated with outcomes in securing and maintaining housing, right? Now let's think about some of these conditions. Um, and there's research on most of these that I'm telling you. You would wanna think about the family size. Obviously, the larger your family is, one would argue the larger the housing stock that you may need, and then particularly where you are, whatever your geographic variation is. I don't know what your housing stock is. There's more or less of that available, and cost is gonna vary. Okay. What are your earnings overall and how regularly do you get those earnings? Okay. How far are you from employment? Do you have school-aged children? If you have school-aged children, the part of the bundle that's about schools might really matter to you. Do you have elderly members? Then the part of the bundle is about how close you are to services might really matter to you. Okay. What's your family health? What's your health? Are you the household, uh, one of the household workers or are you a child and how does that interact with your ability to maintain your housing? And finally, things like whether or not you have a history of incarceration. In the US context, this makes a difference. Think about it this way. 
If you have two actors at the low end of the market, they're exactly alike in all characteristics, earning, creditworthy, and all that. But one person has the market and incarceration record, and a, and a landlord is looking at these two applications. The research shows that the person with the incarceration record is um, less likely to get that housing, all else equal. So I'm telling you this because when you take people and you put them in the private market to seek housing, those variables are going to make a difference in their access to that good. So we've just covered a little bit, and, and here to summarize, modest earning families' lives are challenging in the U.S. context in dynamic ways. And by dynamic, I mean it's not static. So if you look at someone at one point in time and they have these given conditions, that's fine. But if you talk to these families two or three weeks later, it can be a very different situation. That's what I mean by dynamic. It changes rapidly. Okay? Why does it change rapidly? In the U.S. context, a lot of it has to do with the nature of work at the low end. In the U.S. context, uh, jobs, service sector jobs in particular, are not attached to a lot of worker benefits that enable you to deal with having a sick child, that enable you to deal with consistently having, let's say you have childcare, you get it, you go into your service sector job. They say, you know, we don't need you today. We're using an in-time workflow to decide whether we need you. We don't need you today. You can go home. Well, you've just already paid for childcare and you've done these other things, right? So there's a dynamic nature to work at the low end that higher up in the income distribution, when you have things like sick days and benefits, these are not things that you even think happen, but they're very common for families struggling at the low end. More health challenges. What the data tells us is the higher that your income is, also the healthier that you are. So if you're already uh, at the bottom of the income distribution, you're more likely to have more health challenges. Okay? Complicated family structures. You may be more likely to have multiple families. The term they're using in the US, it's not my favorite, it's called multiple partner fertility. All this means is you have kids with different parents in different households, different child support orders, and this sort of things. This makes for a complicated family life. Okay? A higher likelihood of having an incarceration history. And here's the big point from the US system. Our state support in the US is largely work conditioned. Okay? So the earned income tax credit in the US is the largest tax transfer program to working families. It is a work, you have to be working to get it, and it's a work subsidy. Okay? It doesn't really work for non-custodial parents, parents who don't have children uh, in their purview. Uh, the idea of welfare in the U.S. context, 1996 welfare reform ended that. It's a very small residual program. So a lot of the function of the research is about uh, women and children because we don't transfer much to men. Okay. Now here's just a couple slides. I'm going to talk about the U.S. national picture in terms of housing um, to make a point that we don't need a lot of slides to do. So just looking at some of the most recent data, this is from HUD Housing and Urban Development. Um, in the US who every two years they, they do this report to Congress. And this is what the report is called, Worst Case Housing Needs. That's what the report is called. This is the most depressing thing that an, a US academic in housing reads every two years, Worst Case Housing Needs. Okay, so I'm gonna just quickly summarize what that means. Worst Case Needs persisted at high levels across demographic groups, household types, and regions. This is not new information. If I cited the, 20, the, the following prior two years, we would be saying the same thing. Okay? So what are worst case needs? Worst case needs are defined as renters with very low incomes. Okay? With incomes of no more than 50% of the area median income. And these renters do not receive government housing assistance. They pay more than half of their incomes for rent or they live in severely inadequate housing conditions. One thing I want to make clear about this definition is that it's really driven by the inability to afford the housing. It's not driven by inadequate housing conditions. So the U.S. housing stock on average, if you look at the U.S. housing stock across the country, you'll find that 93% of the stock is adequate quality. That means only 7% of the stock is poor quality. However, one thing I will tell you is that 7% of the stock that is of poor quality is disproportionately inhabited by poor women and children and there are implications of that. So here's a lovely little time trend. It's nice, it goes from 2005 through 2015, so you have pre and post Great Recession. Something should be very quickly evident. These are renters with worst case housing needs paying more than half of their income for housing. Starting in 2005, nearly six million, going up in 2009 to seven million. But 2011, 2013, when we're well out of the recession, the recession and unemployment in the U.S. is historically low. 
we see this increase here in the growth in worst case housing needs. So you see even with the economic recovery, worst case housing needs actually increase. Now here, I'm just gonna say a little bit about housing and urban fathers, and not because I'm making the argument that this is the only group that we should talk about, but from a research point of view, we know very little about, um, about fathers, because we don't follow them for the reason that I mentioned before in terms of the state structure of our welfare state. Okay? So we know very little about urban fathers' housing security, particularly for those men who don't live with their children. So for someone who is interested in family well-being, it's very strange for me when I read studies, not to know anything about half of a family, except understanding what their child support orders are. I don't understand how to think about that. So I went to kind of understand something. So this is some work I did with um, a colleague, Amanda Geller, where we tried to figure out, well, what's going on with these guys? Like, what can we know about them, right? So one of the reasons that we don't know a lot about fathers is not, there isn't, I wouldn't say any kind of conspiracy here, it's a data problem, okay? So think about it, if you're using longitudinal data, data over time on the same people, you look at them at time one, you look at them at time two, you look at them at time three, this is the kind of data that researchers want because you can think about things over time, you can get new ordering of events in order, uh, and that's what you want. So longitudinal data is less likely to have information on these men because if they leave the housing unit and we don't track them, we don't know where they go. So we don't know whether they are missing or whether their housing is unstable, probably both, right? So it's kind of a naughty problem. And a lot of researchers don't want to really, you, listen, I'm tenured, so I do kind of what I want to do, but <laughs> junior faculty don't, because you know you don't get publications, you don't get tenure. So there's a reason why the academic world might not pursue this question, I'm not knocking it. But so when you do that, when you pursue it a little bit, um, you come to find uh, something about this instability of these fathers. So here I'll just quickly say, how I thought about housing um, security. The measures aren't perfect, but this is what we had. We thought about homelessness in the past year. We thought about doubled up in the past year. Doubled up is particularly important when thinking about these guys because these are fathers. These are adult men, and so if they're doubling up under like the kindness of somebody else's home, how long is that gonna work out? How long before whoever is hosting you is really done with having you on their couch, right? So it's precarious, right? So we look at doubling up. We looked at skipping a rent or mortgage payment in the past year, which is relatively common. Okay? We look at eviction in the past year, and we look at frequent moves. So what's the question we can ask with the data? We can ask how common is housing insecurity among fathers in US cities of over 200,000? That's the sampling frame of the data, so that's who we can talk about. We use this population-based longitudinal data called the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing data, and look at these dads from their child's birth for nine years, to just get a sense of how they're doing, the kids' first nine years of life. And so what we find is something interesting that you didn't, really didn't know before, and this is nationally representative data when it's weighted. So we find that these dads, about a quarter of them, experience some kind of insecurity. That's interesting. It's more broadly shared than you would think. But your instinct is probably right. You're like, well, it's probably something less extreme than homelessness. Yes, it is less extreme. On average, it's like skipping a rent program, uh, skipping a rent or a mortgage payment. Not awesome. Um, and it seems like the dads might be able to resolve it, but that's a level of economic instability amongst a lot of fathers that we didn't know before. I think it's important to keep track of that. Okay. Now, there are big differences between fathers, though. Just like what you might think, right? Non-resident fathers, those fathers who are living apart from the mothers of their children, are far less likely to report secure housing and markedly more likely to report incarceration. So even though I told you this is the thing about looking at averages and not looking at subgroups, on average, 25% of dads experience fleeting insecurity. But when you dig in and you look at different groups, you have a different story. That's important to know, particularly depending on who you're working with in the US context. Okay? The nature of the housing insecurity experienced by non-resident fathers is qualitatively different than that experienced by their co-resident counterparts. It's more likely, as you thought, to be things like eviction, multiple moves, more serious housing insecurity. Now, what does this descriptive data tell us, and how might this be useful? Okay. Well, what this particular study tells us is a bit about the distribution of housing hardships. Okay. And like I said before, that they're relatively widely distributed between all fathers, but when you look down into the data and you look at non-resident and resident fathers, non-resident fathers experience far more um, challenging housing circumstances. Okay. okay. 
So now I'm going to talk, just switch gears here and talk about some other kind of research that I do where I think about health and housing. So sometimes I think about how a particular aspect of housing, like affordability or the quality of that housing, impacts health. But other times I like to think about it the other way. How does health affect housing, right? That might matter because you might want to intervene in your health system if you do find a relationship. So I do a couple papers that think about that. So I'm going to summarize those here. So the next few studies will look at the results and ask, how does health affect housing, okay? And how do results vary by housing market and welfare policy characteristics? This matters to me because I'm a policy professor. I want to know about the levers of government and what they can do, right? So the first part of the paper is interesting. The second part of the paper is the what do you do with those results part. And then I pose, and hopefully our expert panelists will help us figure out, can these studies help us think about policy and programmatic interventions in your context? So again, using the same nationally representative longitudinal data with populations over 200,000, so large US cities, what do we find? Okay. We find that poor child health increases the likelihood for both overcrowding and homelessness. And it might also increase the likelihood of having inadequate utilities and generally poor housing qualities. Okay? So that's all different parts of the housing bundle that are affected by having a child with a severe limiting health condition. Now in a follow-up study, we wanted to understand how having a child with a severe health condition increases the likelihood that the family experiences homelessness and what policies have to do with it. And this is what we find that particularly in cities with high fair market rents, fair market rents are a HUD indicator of rents that are affordable at the low end of the distribution. It's how they set their subsidies. Okay, so fair market rents aren't high rents and they're not average rents. The rent's affordable at 50% of AMI, okay? In states with less generous public assistance and among individuals who live in poor neighborhoods. So that means there are differential effects. Again, back to this thing. Two families exactly the same, two families with a child with a severe limiting health condition, one lives in state X, one lives in state Y, state X with more generous public assistance, less likely to be homeless, okay? So this is the, these are the parts of the welfare state. Additionally, we find that receipt of housing subsidies, housing subsidies in the US context are incredibly rare, incredibly scarce. One in four who are eligible get them. So they are um, not common, okay? But if you do happen to have one, that reduced the likeliness of homeless in this particular paper. Temporary assistance for needy families is what we used to call our cash welfare benefits. They're quite meager and only for custodial parents, but they did have a mediating effect. Supplemental security income is another income transfer. Okay. These things appear to mediate the effects at least to some extent. Okay. Now, let's put these studies in context. Okay, most families do not have children with severely limiting health conditions. That's not the point of the paper. Most people don't have a child with severely limiting health condition. The point of the paper is that these particular health conditions were health conditions that fam children have that are not associated with parental behavior. Why did we do this? We wanted to get something that was outside of the idea of parental behavior and see if it impacted homelessness. This is not a small thing because let's say we had, again, don't hear me incorrectly. If you have a child in poor health, and it's because the child has fetal alcohol syndrome because you were drinking during a pregnancy. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't have housing, so please don't hear it that way. I mean nothing of the sort. But from a point of an analytic point of view, you want to separate that out so you can see what the direct effect is, the outside effect of it, okay? So these poor health conditions, these limiting poor health conditions were not health conditions that have to do with parental behavior like fetal alcohol syndrome and the like, okay? The point of these studies is to investigate whether a life shock like having a child in poor health, is not directly associated with parental behavior, can directly and independent, independently affect housing? The answer is yes. The answer of this paper is yes. Okay. Another uh, couple analysis we did was thinking about maternal depression during the postpartum year. Again, a, a similar strategy. I shouldn't run, it makes noise, okay? <laughs> a similar strategy with the maternal depression. If you are postpartum depression we're talking about here. Now, if you have a history of depression in your family, or if you were depressed, you're more likely to have postpartum depression. However, not exclusively, there is a relatively big random component to women who get postpartum depression. Now, why that matters from a research uh, perspective is that if it's random, 
It doesn't have anything to do with what you did. So if we study that, it gives us leverage in the way that I just spoke about, okay? So what we find is that maternal depression during the first year is associated with negative uh, health and um, housing outcomes. And so in some other analysis, we find that under conditions of stress, families may trade off between food and housing needs, while others are driven into situations of multiple hardship. This is not a great indicator for families with children one to two years old. So this study suggests in, our, in the US context, and this is particularly important, things tend to be somewhat siloed. So you go to one person to talk about food security, and you go to one person to talk about your housing, then you go to another person to talk about this. But they all relate to each other, okay? So what this study suggests is that these domains, if they are able to work together, will most effectively meet the family needs across these systems, rather than thinking about people as these discrete pots Now, these are the last two slides, and then I am done. Policy implications. It would not be a good thing to give a talk and not think about the policy implications, but I wanted to be cautious. It's the nature of my training not to like over speak my results, and so I'm gonna leave this to all of, of you to think about. What I think the research writ large says and what I think we can take from it is that stabilizing income stabilizing, stabilizes housing. Again, I don't care how you do it. The mechanism, the policy mechanism, you can think about which way you would do it. But stabilizing income allows people to navigate the challenges in their lives, particularly at the low income. The research supports that. So the levers that allow this income supports regular, regularizing even the receipt. Not even necessarily increasing the pie if you can't do that, but regularizing the receipt of it can affect housing outcomes. Okay? The other thing I think is interesting um, that we've been able to find out from some research, from programmatic research, is that small increments of money often allow families to quickly stabilize things before they even need a higher level of service. Sometimes as little as 25 or 50 bucks that enables a family to like fix a shock, then they figure it out. Okay, and they never end up um, being completely housing and stable. This is my last slide. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the family options study in the US. This is a HUD sanctioned, uh, a HUD funded study where they took um, homeless families and assigned in 12 different cities across the country and they randomized them into the kind of services they would get. There were four different treatment groups. I'm not going to get into the details of them, but there were four different ways of providing services that American homelessness researchers believe are important additional care, wraparound services. One of them was just getting a subsidy. Here's a subsidy, go to the free market, figure it out, okay? And then usual care is what a family would get access to just navigating themselves in their you know, continuum of care, okay? So I talk, there's a family option study which is randomized, and then there are also some studies where there are looks at housing first and at randomized controlled trials. Now I'm not going to say too much about those results except to say that across all these three different bodies of literature, subsidies, are effective in stabilizing housing. That's, that you find across all the results. That, that, that I think you can hold on to, okay? Now, how you should deliver them, how you should design them, what level of government should do it, that I don't have the answer to. But the, right, it would be great if I did, right? If you get it, tell me, I'll tell the Americans, okay? How these should be designed or allocated, that's the open question. Um, and the reason why is because it affects the functioning of the housing market. I'm not gonna say too much about that, but that is something that uh, folks do think about. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Curtis, for that. That was uh, a really broad stroke, uh, but very concise and detailed uh, overview of what we need to be doing and what we need to be thinking about. Um, so we're now gonna try the poll, the app to do the live polling. So please get out your phones and please head to the live polling on the app. And I just like Guy, Paula and Mara, would you mind sitting on the, um, getting up while we do this and sitting on the couches? Okay, so the question we have, it's opening soon. on the screen? Okay, so we just focused on one specific part of um, Professor Curtis's address, so 
The question we've got you to just think about is about health and housing. So in Australia, our understandings of the links between secure housing and health outcomes are, and please choose your response. And then I think we start the countdown clock, is that right? Okay, let's start the countdown clock. Stop voting. And the response is, it might have been a Dorothy Dixer. <laughs> Overlooked is in the majority of response, but it's good to see there's only some as well. Um, so that was um, just to get your mind turning because we are going to um, open to audience questions uh, for all the speakers uh, very soon. So just start thinking about that. I'm now going to ask Guy to just provide a little bit of a response to um, Professor Curtis's speech. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> I'm going to stand behind this. I'm not going to run up and down. Um, it's quite impressive. I've read Mara's work uh, quite extensively. It's a complex, it's a rigorous body of work that she's done. The beauty about Mara is that she can then come along and present that to non-experts. There's a couple of things I want to do about, uh, or talk about Mara's presentation, but I want to get one of the key ideas um, from Mara's. I want to try and put that into context around the narrative of homelessness that we use in this country. And the key idea for me is this idea of shock. And I'm going to come back to that. Mara covered a lot of ground, but four issues in particular captured my attention. The first one is, it's a standard one. It's a reminder of how different the US is, and in some ways how lucky we might be if we tapped into some of the sort of the resources and systems that we have. We, there is substantial variation in the states between in the provision of public assistance, health, education, and housing. We have universal health care over here. America doesn't. Incarceration rates in America are significantly higher than they are in Australia. The one thing that we can't forget either is the US is massive compared to Australia. Think about that, uh, the worst, uh, what were they called, worst case housing needs. 8.3 million renters, worst case housing needs. That's a phenomenal number. number. Large numbers create different dynamics and we need to be aware of those differences. But despite those differences and many others, Mara's presentation reminds us of the absolute importance of housing. That stable housing is the platform on which good labour market, educational and health outcomes rests. We need to think of housing as both a treatment and an outcome. And Mara also drew attention to the point that housing subsidies are the most attractive policy for reducing housing instability and homelessness. But we should note that in the US, as in Australia, the optimal arrangement for housing subsidies is not yet clear. Mara also talked about families and fathers. And one idea that surfaced through the presentation is the vulnerability of these groups to some form of shock. As I said, the idea of shock interests me. Low-income families are vulnerable to three particular shocks. Job loss, an economic shock. Increasing housing costs, a housing shock. Partnership dissolution, a relationship shock. But other shocks can have equally devastating impacts on families' housing stabilities. Mara's work on life shocks, for instance, in this case the birth of a child with a severely limiting health condition, is really, really important. Not only are these families considerably, like, uh, considerably, considerably more likely to have been homeless after holding all other variables constant, the effect is much larger in cities with tighter housing markets. Housing markets matter. But I want you to notice also that this is not about the behaviour of people. And Ma uh, Mara was keen to emphasise this. It is about random events that can have a disproportionate impact on low-income families. This is not a trivial finding. In Australia, Journeys Home provides evidence that resonates with this idea. For instance, amongst disadvantaged families, a long-term health condition does not appear to increase the risk of homelessness. But a sudden change in health, a health shock does. This idea of shock 
a sudden unexpected changes of uh, change in circumstances is I think an important one it is an important way about th of thinking about events that trigger homelessness and maintain or contribute to housing instability it is an idea used mainly by economists but also occasionally by politicians the federal government for instance their reluctance to embrace meaningful housing reform in the 2017 budget was based in part on the fear of inducing a housing shock that might have deleterious consequences for the Australian economy. Back to my main point, the idea of shock is not new. But because most of us are not economists or politicians, we tend to use different terms for the same thing. Sociologists have come up with the idea of a critical situation. That is where daily life is so seriously disrupted that our trust in the predictability, continuity and permanence of our social context can be broken. You often in the sector refer to crisis situations, to things breaking down. These are picking up the same sort of issue. Critical situation, a crisis, a shock, they are all referring to a sudden and unexpected change in circumstances. The idea of a shock emphasises the fundamental point that homelessness is a condition and not a permanent status. To become homeless requires some event, some change in condition, a shock. Perhaps we need to think more about the nature of these events and a bit less about individual characteristics. We should focus more on shocks simply because they have a greater impact on those with less social, cultural and economic capital. Compared to middle class households, disadvantaged households have fewer resources to absorb a shock. Thinking about the differential impact of these shocks draws attention to one of the most important conditions contributing to the onset of homelessness in this country. It is the issue of poverty. A focus on housing market conditions is important, no doubt. And the debate about the housing market and the lack of affordable housing has been impressive over the last five years as we're moving forward in a very progressive way. Equally, the identifi identification of subgroups vulnerable to homelessness is a necessary part of effective policy and program development. Hence we have seen strong and effective advocacy campaigns around people leaving state care, people experiencing family and domestic violence and the chronic homeless. But what we are finding in Australia is that risky characteristics may not be as important as we think. When we compare chronically disadvantaged households with no risky characteristics, with households that have risky characteristics, the likelihood of experiencing homelessness is quite similar. What seems to matter, what seems to create the greatest amount of vulnerability is chronic disadvantage, is poverty. I worry that increasing policy interest in various subgroups and people with particular characteristics means that we're in danger of paying insufficient attention to the issue of poverty and how deeply poverty structures our opportunities and our relationships with institutions and with other actors. To me, the relative absence of poverty in Australia of poverty as an empirical and theoretical cornerstone for the homelessness narrative is something we might want to reflect on. A focus on poverty challenges the narrative that we're all one paycheck away from homelessness. It draws attention to the unequal distribution of wealth and opportunity in our community. Mars work, Mars work asks us to consider, the qu consider and question the intersection of poverty with many distinct issues that we will discuss over the next few days. Violence, health, family relationships and housing to name a few. And I think we can enrich the narrative and our an un understanding of homelessness if we do that. Thank you. Well, I hope you are preparing your questions because I think that was a really good scene setting in terms of the interaction between poverty, ho housing and homelessness. So I'm looking forward to hopefully quite a lively session. Um, Paula Coghill will now um, speak from Chair New South Wales for just to reflect on the Aboriginal experience of housing and homelessness in Australia too. I'm trying to go paperless <laughs> and look professional at the same time. Um, yeah, thank you Catherine and thank you Mara. What a, um, astounding speech. Uh, I almost forgot that I was actually going to speak or so riveted by it. Um, 
but certainly um, the, the snapshot of what's happening in, in America um, is, um, yes, we, we may consider that, you know, we're, we're going okay, um, although we still have a long way to go. Um, as I observe protocol, I'd like to acknowledge that I am on um, Kulin Nation country and, um, and I do acknowledge the traditional owners here and, and that I am a visitor uh, in this cold but beautiful country. Um, I am a, a proud member of the uh, Bundjalung Nation, uh, of the Wallaba people of northern uh, New South Wales, which by what the way is the best um, country uh, by far. <laughs> and um, it has nothing to do with football. And um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge um, my elders, past and present, and um, certainly my Aboriginal peers who are in the room here this morning. Um, I'm not sure whether I've, um, I've um, responded so well, but certainly um, I, can, I can resonate with some of the issues that are happening over there, particularly around vulnerable families. And, um, and our, it is no shock for us as Aboriginal people in this country that um, we have experienced high levels of violence, high levels of, um, of um, incarceration. Um, but I'm just going to kind of read from what I did um, until 12.30 last night. And um, because I'm, I'm, you know, I don't do these things often. And, um, and if I ever rehearse, I don't get to sleep and uh, wake up with a, a very big headache. But um, so I'm just gonna read from my notes <coughs> that, you know, I am a proud member of the Wallable people of the Western Bundjalung Nation of Northern New South Wales. Along with uh, Gamilaroi of the Northern New South Wales Tablelands and Gambaga country of the mid north coast of New South Wales. I am bilingual, I'm bi dialectal, and I'm bicultural. I walk a cultural tightrope every day, and do I have anything? Yeah. Which. This is not working. Do I point at it or something? Yeah, that's what I do. White man's magic. <laughs> and, um, and that we um, walk a cultural tightrope every day as Aboriginal people um, in our communities and certainly in our workplaces. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, the First Nations people, we have been here for 61,000 years. We are the oldest living culture on the earth. We are in our 61st millennium. We have not ceded our sovereignty, our rights, and access to this great land. My people come from the fourth world, living in third world conditions in a first world. I work for Community Housing Industry Association, formerly the New South Wales Federation of Housing, as the Aboriginal Specialist, in a role that I have recently taken up uh, in the last 11 weeks. And moving to Sydney is was certainly unaffordable. I felt at times in my first uh, six to eight weeks of um, moving country um, was that um, I too felt like a client at times because the housing market um, and the rental market in Sydney is just phenomenal. It's just unbelievable. Um, previously, I worked as a CEO for the Belangle, Casino Belangle Local Aboriginal Land Council for six years. So you can imagine that I've got a lot to say, particularly working under the most heaviest and best legislation in Australia, uh, the Land Rights Act, and particularly uh, working from that premise on land and ownership of country. Oh, that's what I've got a point at. I'm not gonna read them at the moment, but I just wanna say that um, in response to Mara's um, research and, and speech, um, when we talk about particularly incarcerations uh, of Aboriginal people, we have the highest in the world, even though we're, we're represented as a very small um, country. Prior to 239 years ago, we had no concept of homelessness in this country. We have, I have come to learn very quickly that when we speak about the past, it is still very much the present with us. Because for much of us, not, not much has changed. In fact, things have gotten worse. As First Nations people, we are the first to be homeless in this country. 
and we continue to, to, to do so until changes such as constitutional changes, recognition, treaties and sovereignty is observed and practised in this country. We are the first to be dispossessed, we have lots of lands and we still continue to have lots of lands. Removal and displacement, loss of language, loss of cultural boundaries and cult country boundaries, which means that when I am off country, which my country is Bundjalung, and I'm in another country, um, which is maybe in Sydney, that I am also off country and I'm homeless. Loss of family and kin and stolen generation, and I acknowledge the stolen generation here this morning because we're still trying to find our families. And loss of culture and identity. And I'm not uncomfortable in telling it like it is. One of the successes of having breakthrough is listening and hearing the truth if you are courageous enough and humble enough to sit through its entirety. When an Aboriginal person talks on colonisation, it is from our experience today. Not yesterday, not 50, not 100 years. I was the first child to be born into citizenship in this country. In my family, along with my parents, my siblings were not citizens of this country. The violent and deliberate, well-organised, well-resourced, strategic aim to conquer and take over my country and, and wipe out my people is what we continue to experience today. I have given myself permission and I hope to my fellow Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here that it may take another 200 years or generations for us to heal. So in saying that, I have acknowledged the resilience, the incredible resistance and foresight that I see in so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. We are still here, and despite what's happened, we continue to welcome and often initiate new ways of working together with government, NGOs and agencies that are willing to listen to us, work with us, be guided by us, and congratulate us on our self-determining approaches adopting First Peoples principles, committing to closing the gap in all areas, but are not threatened by our yearning for sovereignty, recognition in the Australian Constitution, treaties and sovereignty. But see too that things need to change and change for the better. I'll just take you through some statistics. And of course, you know, we talk about um, mental health uh, and particularly what Mara talked about in terms of uh, identifying the vulnerabilities. You know, we have intergenerational trauma that has, um, particularly for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the mental um, illness and, and issues are very much on the increase because, again, we're still in very much recovery. And I might just quickly talk about recovery or the, what I call the three R's stages or generations as a people in this country. We still have generations who are still in the recovery, and I'm certainly one of them. But we also have generations who are reclaiming our rightful place and working alongside our non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peers to, to work towards reconciliation, to work towards closing the gap, to work towards um, uh, finding solutions on how we can move forward. And certainly generations of redressing which I hope is that our children in the future. But please note that we're not totally responsible for the redressing. It has to also come from you. So I'll just take you back to the... Oh, that's right, that point. Okay. Um, and we all know the story. And, um, but it's always a good opportunity to, to remind people. So, in t and these are recent statistics. In 2016, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people experienced homelessness. I mean, we're still homeless. 239 years later, we are still homeless. More than two out of three are living in severely crowded dwellings, which is less than 10% sleeping rough. And I might just uh, respond to um, Mara's um, um, definition of um, uh, um, large families. We have what we call extended families and we have multiple families living together. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people made up 24%, uh, 61 nationwide, 
uh, of those accessing SHS in 2015-16, up 16% from 2014-15. In 2013, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children aged 0 to 17 access SHS organisations nine times the rate of non-Indigenous children. Aboriginal children enter out-of-home care at ten times the rate of non-Aboriginal children. At the 30th of June 2016, there were 16,846 Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. And that's very much uh, on the increase. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander imprisonment rate, in fact, uh, more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are removed now than when the Stalin generation. So it's certainly a big, big issue. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander imprisonment rate uh, increased from 2,253 in 2015 to 2,346. At the same time, the non-Indigenous <coughs> imprisonment rate increased from 146 to 154 prisoners per 100,000. Um, in 2016, 162 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people died as a result of suicide. The death rate of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people was 23.8 deaths per 100,000 people compared to 11.4 deaths per 100,000 for non-Indigenous people. In fact, uh, with the, the NT intervention, and I acknowledge um, my um, NT uh, community up there, um, particularly with the, the government Inter, uh, intervention, um, the, the, the suicide rate had risen to 500 percent, which is a real big concern. And as young as eight to um, you know 34, uh, in that range, um, that it was such an indictment on, on, on government and such a military exercise as well. I may add. Just um, specifically on, on Aboriginal community housing providers, um, there are almost 5,000 properties managed by Aboriginal community housing providers in New South Wales, including around th 3,000 properties, housing around 6,500, which are managed by registered Aboriginal community housing providers. Almost 2,000 properties managed by self-funded Aboriginal organisations. And um, I just read most recently the success of the Victorian Aboriginal housing uh, company and uh, I congratulate them on that, that um, they're certainly becoming um, a leading um, body in, in um, Aboriginal people um, managing um, housing stock. Aboriginal people living in community housing managed by other CHPs. Um, it's just a bit of a disclaimer, please note that these numbers do not include households housed by Aboriginal community housing providers not funded by FACS. So these are in addition to households living in properties managed by Aboriginal community housing providers. One in ten households have identified Aboriginal members, almost 3,000 households. About one in six of households newly housed in 2016-17 had an identified Aboriginal member. In affordable renting ha rental housing, 9% of housing, households have an identified Aboriginal member. One in ten of households newly housed in 2016-17 have an identified um, Aboriginal um, members. I just want to say that the first social housing in this country was the Missions and Reserves, in which one I grew up on, in Tabulum, and, um, and that was the first social housing. Land councils are, are one of the biggest cohorts in providing <coughs> housing in New South Wales. They own 60% of the sector. And li unlike what Mara was talking about, when we talk about the different issues, um, we've never separated the, the homelessness with housing. If you don't have a home, you don't have a, you're homeless or if, you, if you, you're homeless because you don't have a house. We've never had to, uh, I've separated the two. Um, in fact, when we talk about the health, housing, when we talk about unemployment, when we talk about um, high rates of incarceration, um, uh, low mortality, you know, it's the Aboriginal sector because we're in, we represent in every single one of them. So um, thank you, Mara, and I just want to mention that um, some of the good practices that, um, you know, in terms of taking us forward, um, just really need to be highlighted very quickly. Um, and I have, and one, one particular one that we launched earlier this year, the, the, um, the Homelessness Accord, which is the first for New South Wales, and I think the first for, um, for, the, for the country, in that, um, you know, it really binds and uh, assist organisations to be committed to uh, redressing um, homelessness uh, for Aboriginal people in this country. So thank you very much. Thank you.
I might stand. Thank you very much, Paula, for um, providing the perspective from Aboriginal uh, perspective as well. And so it's now time. We've got quite a lot of time for questions, which is really good. Um, I just thought I'd give Amara an opportunity just to reflect on what Guy and Paula have spoken about. And I guess just uh, if you wanted to provide any comments around um, the intersection, I guess, of race, poverty and uh, housing as well in, in the context of, of your research, if, if there's anything you had to say around that. Well, I guess I would just say um, it's very always very interesting. You know, research by nature is you ask very narrow questions and then you have to back out to see what the context is. And so for me, listening to Guy and Paul, it was very interesting. I learned about your welfare state in a different sort of yeah. way. I was struck by something that Guy said I hadn't known. So what is your poverty rate here for, what's your, what's your poverty rate here? Guy, Guy? Off the top of the head, head, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I mean, so that, but that's interesting, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the US, the poverty rate uh, is 11% for adults, okay? But when you look at children, it goes up right higher. And if you look at kids of color, black and Latino kids, it goes up to 25%, so one in four children. This has been the case since I started doctoral training, and that was the one statistic that I learned, and I was like, okay, I guess I'm gonna do this for a living because this shouldn't stand in, in the country that I live in, right? Um, so this conversation about having a conversation about poverty, even in a fuller welfare state, you have a much fuller welfare state here. That's lovely, right? Um, but it's interesting. I would wanna know about your poverty rate in the, you know. So Can I add one? 13.2. 13.3? Can I add one thing on that? 13.3. So about two percentage points higher on average your poverty rate is. Um, an interesting thing on the poverty rate um, or on poverty as such is the sort of prevailing view that poverty is a very transient experience for most Australians. Um, the sort of sense that poverty is not a persistent experience mm. and certainly when you come from the sector and certainly some of the work that we've done it looks like it is more persistent that people get trapped down there for a lot longer but that's certainly not the prevailing view on pov uh, amongst uh, policy makers certainly at a federal level and probably at a, lesser, uh, uh, at a state level as well and that concerns me because I actually think it is more persistent mm. than we imagine and that has different implications than people just dropping in for a very short period of time and getting out um, so yeah. All right, we might open the questions up. And so you can do it via the app and you can also do it, we've got some roving mics. So I might just start with an app question and most people are sending them in anonymous, which is fine. Um, I'm just gonna ask the panel, I guess, there's a question around sleeping rough and the shock and chronic disadvantage and whether or not uh, life shocks are, you know, ex explain the, the inc you know, the, the ex you know, the, fact that people end up sleeping rough? Uh, look, I'll, I'll give that a crack, and probably not. Um, when, when you have a look at the sort of the biographies of people who end up chronically homeless, the biographies characterised by trauma in early childhood, later childhood, there's a whole range of issues. I, I don't want to sort of o overstretch this idea of shock as we'll cover every situation, it won't. Um, but one of the things that we do know is that some people who come into the homeless population for a reason, such as an economic shock, they get trapped in there and their circumstances end up getting worse and their health suffers, um, they end up in the population for a long period of time. And then they look, they have a similar characteristics to what we imagine the chronically homeless to be. So I don't want to overemphasize this notion of, of shock will explain everything, but it does give us some leverage on certain things that I think are worth discussing. All right, we might open it to the floor. Has anyone got a question? Well, we have shyness in the first session. I'm sure by the end of day two. Ah, we have one down the front. Yes, it's coming. So if you could just say, you, can, you, you don't have to be anonymous if you're standing, so you can say where you're from and who you are. Um, I am homeless. Um, well, I guess I'd like to start by saying um, the shock is the lack of kindness that you can experience when you're homeless. People, even in your own family, you often get treated like you failed because you're homeless. Um, there's a great intolerance because we have this promising work ethic in our society, everyone should get a job. If you haven't got a job, it's your fault. It's called victim blaming. It's very common. Um, what I've certainly discovered, I've been homeless probably on and off for three years. People don't think either. Like, people don't think to check on you. I never get visitors, and I'm not... When I say this, this is not really trying to appeal to the heartstrings here. 
It's not that I'm in any way socially isolated, I'm not. It's more that I've become isolated as a result of this type of status. We're an economic system that rewards the winners, which we call it those with money. Those without money are seen to have failed. But certainly what I've experienced is there is a failure within us as human beings to emotionally connect. I see it as a structural violence, not a housing problem. Structural violence is the inequality which the indigenous people experience on a daily basis, which is unquestioned in our society. Um, we, we tend to resonate with our own group, but we don't actually step out of our comfort zone to take someone in. I can, I've only got one friend that I can actually stay with if I'm really desperate. I can't ask other people because you overstay your welcome. I don't have any income because I'm in conflict with the government, given the rewarding in the job provider system. So they've cut me off Centrelink because I've raised objections to the rorting in the job provider system. I cannot access or take money, taxpayers' money, from a system that's corrupt. Now, I've been to the Prime Minister, I've been to the Minister. Uh, do you have a question for the panel? Sorry yeah, to interrupt. Yeah, I have yep. to say what I have to say. I'm sorry. Yep. I, I realise I'm taking up time. But they're important issues that I feel I have to raise. Um, I guess from the point of view of the panel, I'd like you to address the structural violence issue of inequality, which comes from this economic paradigm of haves yep. and have-nots and how we can create some sort of stability, uh, middle ground between that. That's a great question. So please, um, yep. if you can answer that. Great question. Panel, are you up? <laughs> up? How do you address the structural violence of... of oh, well, I've got a mic, haven't I? Yeah, you've got one there. <laughs> <laughs> Just um, in terms of um, the, the, the systems of government, um, particularly around the job, job networks and stuff like that, I think, you know, it does <laughs> increase um, the vulnerabilities of, of um, particularly uh, for for families, you know, in terms of meeting um, those compliances and, and um, I mean, I know that, you know, it, in the whole Centrelink ha um, job networks that particularly for Aboriginal people, um, <laughs> we're the highest breached um, community as well because we're not meeting those, those, those rules and regulations and for all sorts of, for all sorts of reasons, um, particularly you know, if we're talking about, if we've got a, a funeral to attend to, but we've got an appointment at the same time on that same day, we're more likely to go to the f that to pay our respects rather than go to a Centrelink uh, appointment and therefore get breached um, because, you know, our cultural obligations take precedent. And, um, and it's for, you know, for those reasons. But again, you're right. I mean, I think one of the biggest shocks is human kindness. And, um, and, and, and just humanity, uh, being able to relate and connect and, and, and work together, um, I think is, is certainly something that, you know, we can try and figure out over the next two days. And, and just following on from that question, there's been one on the app, and that's it's oh. for Mara, and it's uh, reflecting that there's a strong narrative in popular media in Australia that people who experience homelessness do so as a consequence of their own poor choices. And just a question around, given the, the, your presentation, to what extent is this the case in the US and how do we actually respond? It's very challenging for us as a peak as well around responding to that, that blaming of the individual and the individual choice. And if you have any comment on that. These two questions to me are related and they're about yep. the dominant, they're the country specific dominant paradigm about why we observe what we observe. So the US is a bootstraps, value-based, system where the belief is that if you um, submit yourself to the discipline of the labor market, you will be successful. Now, even when people espouse more progressive ideas, that is the stew in which we all sit. And it sounds to me like your paradigm might be similar. So whenever you fall out of that, if you are a loser in the economic game, then it implicates something about your personhood. And that attitude is shared across the income distribution in the US. So folks who become homeless or have that kind of experience also internalize these feelings about the wrongness of coming out on the wrong side of, a, of a, the economic order. So for me, it's a long-term game around how we understand our relationship to markets, right? 
So there are different philosophies. You can think that a, a free market um, has it waxes and wanes along with the business cycle, and sometimes it's up and sometimes it's down. And a different model would say we have to insure people against that risk, and we've done some of that insuring, and you've got some of that insurance here. But the philosophy up here has to change. So what's happening stateside is people are don't stop. Every day is a protest. I'm on a college campus. Every day is a protest, and people are challenging that paradigm. They're challenging that view around who is poor and why we witness what we witness. And I don't think there's any other way around it. I teach, there's 100 of them, and they are constantly saying things. I'm not defensive, let's work it out. Because that paradigm, we all swim in it, so we're affected by it, right? So we have to challenge it internally and externally and how we deal with each other and how we allow the problem definition to be held um, in media and other places, right? So, th so I think it's a long game, um, but you know, what else am I doing, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, a, a question from the floor. We have one over there um, on my right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Therese. I'm from Terry's Place in Maitland in the Lower Hunter. Um, I am a coordinator of our outreach program. I'm finding consistently that we're getting a lot of referrals from people who have disabilities or mental health issues. It seems that our most vulnerable people in the community are the ones ha who are being evicted. I think we have to address this within tenancy law legislation and things like that, but um, it just doesn't seem to be happening. So I'm really concerned at the amount of, uh, it's, it's a flow on effect from everything. There is a whole lot happening, but I'm wondering if that is a consistent theme within all other organisations around Australia. Um, and I'm finding that we don't have the opportunity to refer to get external supports um, for disability services or mental health services because these people have now ha are required to have NDIS packages, which is a disability insurance scheme in our area, and that is such a difficult process to go through and the time frame around those, uh, those constraints are just terrible. Months and months and months before these people actually can secure additional support. Our caseloads are, uh, uh, yep. just right now, in my organisation, I think I have nearly over 60 people on our wait list that I have to triage every yep. day. And those uh, people are mums in their cars with six children. Yep. So, yeah, so. And men, and men, victims of domestic violence, mental health, drug and alcohol, so disability. So the, the question is about the, the siloing of um, programs and mental health and disability. Is that is the, the question for it the is panel? Is yep, and okay. And about whether consistently across the board people are finding that same sure. thing. Sure. Yep. Guy, do you want panel wants to? I'll, I'll make one observation. I, I can't comment directly on that. I mean, clearly, with the NDIS, it's a changing landscape. Um, there's going to be winners, and clearly, there's going to be some losers in that situation. I'll, I'll talk briefly about one finding that's coming out of this Journey to Home study, which is very counterintuitive, but maybe it, it sends a signal about the importance of both housing and support. And, and, and the finding was this, that people with a diagnosed mental health problem amongst a chronically disadvantaged sample were less likely to become homeless than those with an undiagnosed problem. Okay. And that didn't make sense in some ways. But part of it might be that those who are actually hooked in, who are diagnosed or hooked into the mental health system, that offers some protection against homelessness. That's really important then, so that's some evidence that support makes a difference. The other key finding that came from that was around what housing, what sort of housing provides the best protection for low-income families. And it wasn't the private rental market, and that wouldn't surprise you. It wasn't community housing. It was public housing. <laughs> and the magnitude and significance of that was large, right? Yet we're moving in the entire different direction. So there's some clues around, I can't answer your question directly, but we're getting some interesting evidence which both supports what we intuitively know about housing and support, but also throws up some challenges as well. And I think that's a good space to be in. Right, and there's, I've now got a question again from the app, and it's about overcrowding and the discussion, Mari, you had in your presentation around the, the different makeups of families and the different arrangements that families have and how you consider housing in that context and how you ensure that housing is appropriate for, for people who may have large or different types of families. So that's for Paula and for Mara. <laughs> so the crowding, the crowding research, um, so I hear two things in the question. One is about 
and the sizes of families and the housing stock available to them. And then the other part of the question is about different preferences for how large families are. Do you think I read that yeah, properly? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so I, I can say what the research says about crowding, and some of it really based here, right? Um, the, so it's usually people per room, and sometimes it's people per census tract, and the relationship between crowding at that level and communicable diseases. And then the public health folks step in and get concerned about housing stock crowding. So that's one part of research. There's another part of research um, with a good methodology which looks at um, crowding and finds negative outcomes for uh, kids' educational outcomes, but also their mortality down the road. And that generally, the mechanism tends to be about inability to manage stimuli. Like your inability to get space to do what you need to do. So I'm not giving you an answer, I'm telling you what the research is. Now, I, I, the, the part about, um, if you have folks who want to be in larger extended families, then you have to have stock that supports it. I mean, I think that's, to me, that's the obvious answer. That's a separate issue from a crowded census tract where there's communicable diseases and your health people step in and make sure that people are immunized or whatever. So they seem, seem to be to be separate issues. But you have to be sensitive to how people want to live. Um, in the US welfare state, privacy is king. And so we, we, if people want to share, we take away their benefits. So that's not useful either, mm -hmm. right? So we disincentivize sharing housing. Um, because of the ethos in, on the states. So, right. anyway. Yeah. Uh, just in terms of um, extended families, I guess, um, which is what um, most Aboriginal families are made up of, um, I know that, you know, particularly uh, for Aboriginal housing providers who are coming together and thinking about innovative ways of, of housing stock and how do, we, how do we participate in development and, um, and have a say in how the design of, of yeah. housing stock to accommodate uh, extended families. And oftentimes, you know, an observation is made that it is overcrowding, but, you know, a lot of Aboriginal families do make it work where they, they do have the extended family, they have more than one family living in there, but the housing stock often conflicts with that because they, they just don't have the, the participation to, do, to look at design. and. And, um, and particularly under the NRS, I mean, you know, just for New South Wales, we have 144 um, registered providers and only three are Aboriginal. So we still have a long way to go even under the NRS uh, in order for us to have an pl equal playing field and an equal participation um, in the housing sector in terms of, of um, you know, having opportunities to, to look at partnering and um, better partnerships <coughs> and certainly um, opportunities to look at development in, in, in a more um, innovative way and a more economical way as well. So still have a long way to go. Great, I think we'll take one from the floor. Yep, there's one just in the middle here. Hi, I'm Kelly Hanson from Nova in Newcastle. I guess I wanted to go back to poverty. I, in the 80s we talked about no child living in poverty we talked about a standard of living. I think everyone in this room would know that older women are the emerging cohort, it's due to poverty. We know that women who are in a violent situation would move out much quicker if they were concerned about poverty and homelessness. We also know about women who've lost their children and tried to get their children back, cannot find accommodation suitable because they're on New Start, so poverty. So how do we get poverty back on the public discussion and how do we get politicians to listen? Because we know that so many things would be resolved if we started to really care about our most vulnerable and started talking around how we could fix the equality issue around poverty. I, I mean, to me, that's the exact question. I mean, I don't, I don't provide the answer to that. I mean, what concerns me is it's slipped off the agenda. I think we're speaking in a room where everyone's this is al almost preaching to the converted in some ways here, <laughs> is how you introduce that back into the public debate. I mean, we were talking before about how the public responds to homelessness. I suspect everyone in this room at some stage is, someone's asked them, what do you do when you work in the field of homelessness? And why do they choose to be homeless? It's a question we always hear. It's deeply ingrained in the community psyche. The issue that is how do we pull that out and reinsert this issue about structural violence, about poverty? I don't know, but one of the things that I have been impressed with recently is the way that social media campaigns are really pushing the boundaries of debate and engaging 
far more people than maybe previous advocacy campaigns um, did. So to me, it's, I'm, I purposely want to throw that up, not to give you the answer, but to say that's one thing I'd like to see this conference at least consider is how to reinsert that in all the respective areas of interest for all of you, whether that be young people, older people, single people, indigenous people, whoever. I want to see as much as we need to talk about housing. I'd like to see the issue of poverty thrown into that discussion as well. Great. I think that's... Um, there's also a question just on the app again, Mara, about your research into uh, urban fathers and, and incarceration. And just if you, uh, question if you made a comparison with mothers who'd been in custody and so whether or not it was significantly different for, say, fathers who'd been in custody as opposed to mothers. Their but chances in the housing market? Yeah, that's so right. There is, so I haven't done research on um, incarceration in mothers, but others have. So the first thing to know about um, just in the U.S. context, because incarceration is so highly skewed male that um, when you look at the women who are incarcerated and then follow their trajectories, it's harder to say things uh, about them just because your N is small. That said, the studies that have looked at mothers with incarceration records um, find difficulties not dissimilar to fathers in terms of their access to getting housing. They're gonna meet that same market um, and because of the way if they're eligible for it, again, the, um, welfare reform made it such that um, the benefits are, are, are quite low and you have to be working. So the same ways in which incarceration disenfranchises and makes it difficult for men also would be at play for women, but uh, the numbers are just smaller. But their trajectories are, are not any more rosy and they're less likely to be able to um, get their kids back if, they, if they're mothers, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the trajectories are not super different, but we don't have as much numbers, um, and the implications for children are different because mothers still tend to be custodial. Yeah. Great, thank you. Another one from the floor. Yep, uh, we've got one down the front and down the back. Luce, I think there's one down the, f uh, yep, down the front. Hi, I'm Helen, and I'm part of the PES team through um, VHP, Council for Homeless Persons, and also um, part of the league through um, Launch Housing. And my question is, you know, we have lived experience, and I'm one of them, and we don't have them in all organisations, for one. And two, um, we need to be um, talking to the people who come into the services and asking the question, one, how do we identify? And, and two, you know, what, what's going on in the day-to-day -day lives? Because we're missing out on people who may not identify as um, being without a home. And um, it's really important that we, um, as people have said, that, you know, what sort of housing are they, do they need? Because if you're just a single person, they think you just need one bedroom. But yep. if you have another condition that may get worse in the long term, they may need another grant for something yeah. like a carer. And we're not looking at, you know, the various types of social housing that goes for any income that's low. Because yeah. there's gaps. Yeah. So I guess that's the question again um, around um, looking at people more broadly than the individual and looking at other needs and, and, and family issues as well um, that might need to be considered in terms of providing housing anyone had any comments on that? I'll just make, I'll make a quick one. Um, as a colleague of, of, of Mara's, Dan O'Flaherty, has done a really interesting paper and that basically says that people are coming into services hold really important knowledge and if we just get to a tick box mentality, we miss that knowledge. We miss the conversation and the story about events and things that are happening in their lives and we become obsessed with the characteristics of people. So it's a really important point the characteristics but also events and experiences and what's going on in people's lives is really important about making effective in interventions. So I hope we don't lose sight of that along the way as we become more evidence-based and start to see that as, as in terms of just tick boxes or something like that. And I have another question from the app which is again, uh, it's about a reflection on the increasing uh, insecurity of work um, and, the, and the rise of the gig economy and the 
findings of, from your presentation around the importance of stability of income and whether you had any comments about the increasing nature of the gig economy and what that might mean in terms of housing and homelessness in the future. Well, so I, I can say um, some things from a, a layperson's point of view because I don't, I don't formally study um, labor market stuff, so this would just be coming from my perspective, so I want to make that clear. Um, mm, okay, what can I say that that doesn't overstep what we know? Well, I can say, what I can say, at least in the U.S. context, is that we have data about the um, un raveling of um, benefit, you don't have this here because you have universal health care, right? But the unraveling of the benefit structure and the nature of the benefits that firms offer bevels in a structural disadvantage in the U.S. between certain types of workers. And it's often very invisible because the workers who are attached to large firms, so in the U.S. everything, you know, you get your 401k, there isn't a pension, and you <coughs> use tax deferred dollars to do all kinds of things to get to, to defer costs for child care, pre-tax dollars, right? So you save your marginal tax rate. So if you're 25, <laughs> this may be too wonky, if you pay 25% taxes, you're, you're paying 25 cents less. And all this stuff happens seamlessly. It's your job. It's just one of the things, oh, you know, oh, it's always oh, awesome, blah, blah, blah. So you get this real difference in our culture where folks who have access to all these benefits don't realize that they're the only ones who do, that these other jobs don't have access. And so then you have this increasing separation by class um, usually signified by a high school degree or greater. And so when I teach young people and I ask them these things, they just take it for granted because their parents have these kinds of gigs and they have access to insurance and they stayed on their family's insurance until they're 25 and la, la, la. And I'll have a student over there who has their tag on because they're going to work and they're supporting themselves. And so you have this huge divergence because of the welfare state because in the U.S., we deliver a lot of welfare goods through the firm that you work for. So if you win that lottery, if you get that family, awesome for you. If you don't, you have a very different life experience. Uh, what that means for the gig economy and the rest of I can't make those leaps of logic. They're too far for my training to make me uncomfortable, but I can offer that. <laughs> right. All right, question up the back of the chair. Thanks. Hi there, my name's Daniel. I'm one of those supportive places, and thank you for our sponsors. Guy, I think I heard you say you're getting better results, not from the private market, not from the community housing providers, it's the state, the state housing, right. Now, the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation that's just been released is only, the billions of dollars of that is only going to be articulated through the community housing provider sector. A bit ironic, really, if the better results for the money that you put in the bricks and mortar part of it came through the state thing, but it's only going to go through there. So, will there be any housing for homeless <coughs> uh, performance in, um, you know, requ requ requirements tied to the financing of the community housing provider industry through the NHFIC. I mean, it's, it's just, it's an interesting par policy paradox at the moment that we have evidence that one form of housing seems to provide much better prote protection than the way we're going. But we need to dig a little bit underneath that in some ways because the, the, the truth of the matter is that state housing authorities have a much greater capacity to carry debt and the way that they've structured community housing providers don't give them that option. So in part here it's about the financial model and the subsidies that they offer to community housing providers and the need to reflect on those. They're making community housing providers run a very thin ship financially and in terms of their solvency, they need to be very careful about issues to do with arrears and so forth. So if we had a more generous um, arrangement, financial arrangement, I'm so sure community housing providers could do a similar job. But you just start to see that it's the capacity of the state to wear debt that would be one of the factors mm. that is making it uh, provide greater protection against homelessness. The issue is also about who we're housing in these, uh, in these forms of housing. Um, are we housing dis uh, similar groups or are we comparing apples and oranges? And in fact, if you look at the data from uh, the AIHW, it shows that the number of people in greatest need has increased considerably in community housing providers. It's jumped about 20% over the last five years. If you dig a little bit further though and have a look at how you define greatest need, you'll see that there is some reason to be a little bit cautious about making those claims 
because greatest need can include someone who's chronically homeless, it can also include someone who's paying a high rent. And I know from a tenancy landlord perspective, dealing with someone who's got a few financial problems is very different from dealing with someone who's got a chronic history of homelessness, who's experienced trauma, has a drug issue and so forth. So there's all of these things that are playing out there. Part of this, I think, is that we want the discussion around housing to, I think, effectively deal with not just the total sum of money coming into the sector, but how it's then distributed uh, for community housing providers and the services they provide.